especially the African-American population um, that live in this community and in this area. The Southside Community Association, along with uh, the NAU Ethnic Studies Department, the NAACP, Alpha Epsilon Sigma of the Phi Beta Sigma uh, Fraternity Incorporated, and that group is out of Phoenix, uh, Kappa Sigma Sigma of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, um, the Coconino County African Diaspora Advisory Council, and there are four historically founded Black churches in Flagstaff, River, Riverside Church of God in Christ, First Missionary Baptist Church, Spring Hill Baptist Church, and Harbor Chapel uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, and those are the partners that have come together to sponsor this series. Um, we have, um, well, this is our second one, and there will be four more series, four more topics. Um, and toward the end of this program, we will definitely make sure that we uh, give you those dates again so that you can mark them in your calendar. Um, with that being said, I think I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Bernadine Lewis, who is going to uh, read our policy brief. Um, she's gonna summarize the policy brief the, uh, and she'll ask um, if, any, if anyone has any clarifying questions and then we'll go right into our discussion. Thank you, Ms. Deb. Um, we still also have um, guests that are still coming in. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today's town hall um, will focus on uh, the Black representation and um, preservation um, of the culture um, and the lived Black experience here in Flagstaff. Uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, not unlike most American towns, reflects a complex story of America's tangled understanding of its racial history. Compounded to this is also the challenge of persuading city leadership to invest in measures that support the representation, resilience, and historical preservation of Flagstaff's past, present, and future Black culture and lives. Given the disparity of Black wealth and political influence, we as African diaspora people must move beyond the pain and frustration while still seeking to be seated at the table of equality. As we take our seats, we still find, we're still seeking to find our voice um, as we sit at this table of equality. And we are asking that our intellectual and artistic contributions and blood, sweat, and tears be fully validated and acknowledged as America's history. Also today, we are asking this in the bitter memory of our African ancestors who were brought here, they were bought and sold, and with whipped backs, toiled as free labor to build these United States of America. Historically, uh, a Northern Arizona town uh, their first census in 1860 counted 21 freed black male or female. Africana people have been in Flagstaff since the 1800s, 1880s actually, when men moved here to work on the railroad. In the 1920s, we see a significant number of Black people who would migrate to Flagstaff to work as lumberjacks, 
And uh, these were black people who came here to find better lives for their families. They found other work as miners, farm hands, housekeepers, cooks, shopkeepers, and ultimately teachers, school administrators, and what was then referred to back then as secretaries. The black population has never been one of vast numbers here in Flagstaff in Northern Arizona uh, as a whole in the state of Arizona. However, our presence in the community was not what many or our presence here in the, in the community uh, was not what many of us describe today as being invisible in a population of over 70,000 residents here in Flagstaff. The new, newly formed Lived Black Experience Community Coalition are 12 members who currently reside or have resided in Flagstaff. Our mission to create discussions that educate, enlighten, and inform our acquaintances friends, and neighbors of other ethnicities, but primarily of European American descent about our story and the experiences that we are having and have had while living Black in Flagstaff. It is through these town halls that the coalition wants to move the Flagstaff community from actively listening to supporting its Black representation and preservation with moral conviction, personal involvement, and the investment of tangible and financial resources. And so with that, uh, to, to give a little context of, of what uh, the Black presence is here uh, in Flagstaff, uh, we know that um, African Americans in Flagstaff have primarily lived in the South Side and Pine Knoll areas. We know that uh, many of the homes where Black people resided are still owned by the original family, but some of those owners may no longer live here in Flagstaff. Um, when we talk about Black representation and preservation, it cannot be discussed without mention of the Black church. And in the opening, uh, Ms. Deb uh, uh, gave the names of those churches, uh, First Missionary Baptist, um, where Evangelist Shirley Sims is the assistant minister. Uh, Spring Hill Baptist Church, which is led by second generation church pastor uh, Simi Clayton. And then there is the Riverside Church of God in Christ and the Harbor AME Church. And historically, we know that uh, the Black church has always been the community center. Um, historically, it is for, 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 for us in the Black community, uh, the church has served as both the school site and the place for social functions. During the week, the Black church uh, can be the daycare center and preschool. It provides meals to the clergy and its, its congregants, um, to the community, to people without homes. And some Black churches have even uh, served uh, as a prison ministry to help pris newly released prisoners get back on their feet. But most importantly, the Black church has always provided child care uh, during the summer, for example, vacation Bible school, and was historically the meeting place uh, during the civil rights movement. The Black community also, uh, no matter where, even here in Flagstaff, 
has always had businesses that provide services that are unique to the culture. So for example, uh, there were black barber shops and hair salons, um, hat shops, uh, butcher shops that sold the meats that, that, that we um, typically eat in our culture. That would be anything uh, like chicken gizzards, uh, turkey wings, fat back, um, oxtails. And, and then every black community that you go into, you will typically find a, a soul food, what we call a soul food restaurant where those foods are cooked and um, they are traditionally served with collard greens, lima beans, okra, black eyed peas, which are typically complemented with white rice and gravy, macaroni and cheese, buttermilk biscuits or <laughs> cornbread. Um, when we look at the history of Flagstaff's Black men um, coming to the city, they were lumberjacks. Um, they were railroad men. They were miners. And the women, like most in the African American culture, were laundry, laundresses, uh, shopkeepers, cooks, seamstresses, nurses, and maids. Those fortunate enough to complete specialized studies or a four-year college became then called secretaries and school teachers and even uh, school administrators. Some black men found a decent living becoming personal drivers and lawn care workers to the wealthy or they worked as maintenance um, uh, staff at schools and local businesses. Very few Negroes were able to attend college after graduating high school, and most Black men completed college degrees after returning from World War II. When we look at uh, the Black presence here in Flagstaff, uh, during those, during the 1920s, we know that we had an Elks Lodge and a Black Masonic Hall. And it should be noted that the European Masons and Shriners uh, met in a separate uh, hall. The uh, Benevolent and Protected Order, uh, Protective Order, of the Elks of the World is an African-American fraternal order that was established in 1897 here in the United States. And the, the Elks order is said to have been descended from the Free African Society. And the Free African Society is the first known formal Black society in America. And so it was the Elks Club when, when Black people were traveling or moving to a new city or state, um, these people would look to find the Elks Club in the community. And it was here that they could uh, find meals. The Elks Club typically um, and historically has a full kitchen. Um, they were able to find lodging assistance and trusted guidance and advice when traveling. These lodges were listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book, and that was an annual guidebook used by Black travelers to navigate the United States, and in this case, to navigate coming out uh, to Arizona during the Jim Crow era. And this guidebook featured Black-owned businesses and hotels, gas stations, uh, restaurants, barbershops, and beauty salons, or back then we called them beauty parlors and dance halls. And, and so the, these travelers would look uh, through this book to find out where Black people were welcomed, where they would be safe, and where they would not be denied service. Um, there is a, uh, 
older copy of um, uh, the of Flagstaff uh, Green Book, which lists um, a few rooming houses that also provided meals uh, to travelers as they were coming through Flagstaff. Uh, uh, we would add to this that the Sims family, when we talk about the, El the Black Elks Club, um, the Sims, uh, they are one of the, the few remaining longtime Black Flagstaff families, and they now own the historic Elks Club, um, which was located on San Francisco Street. Uh, currently, there are only two brick and mortar representations of African American or Black businesses here in Flagstaff, one being a barber shop and the other a co-op market that assists uh, the community um, members who are associated with it in launching their own retail and food businesses. Pardon me. Um, while we know that there are, there could be um, more businesses owned by uh, Black community members, here are the ones that are, are most well known. Uh, Dirty Bird Spices, which is owned by Brandon Billings Reber, uh, Destiny's Creations, um, these are homemade bath and body products and handmade greeting cards that are created and owned by our current mayor, Coral Evans, and her daughter, Destiny Evans. Uh, these products are available in the market of dreams and in other uh, local uh, retailers. Then there's Elijah Smith, who provides D DJ services for private parties and special events. Gallivant, which is a uh, accessory and women's clothing business owned by Kim Robinson. We've seen that business uh, transition from a brick and mortar um, and it was quite extraordinary to, to be able to say that a Black woman had a downtown uh, business, but that business has now transitioned uh, to an online and mobile business. We have Jerry Nichols, who is a local musician, um, plays around town with his band, Dub and Down with the Blues. He's a personal clothing designer has a line of clothing, and he's also a food caterer. His brother, uh, Jabbar Nichols, is the owner of Cuts Barbershop and College. And Black communities traditionally have always um, had some celebrated soul food chefs um, who cater for church fundraisers and special events. Um, and are always there to serve the family uh, dinner uh, after um, a funeral service. We know that Miss Sissy Hickman, um, she's known for her culinary skills here in the community, um, and she fries some very good fried chicken <laughs> and makes some good potato salad. So these are just seven examples of, of, of Black business owners. Um, but here again, uh, we submit to you that these are virtually invisible uh, people here in the community and it, most of all, invisible businesses um, within the Flagstaff community. Uh, next to Black spirituality and religion, we use art to tell our story through drawing and painting, literature, poetry, music, and theater. The only artistic evidence of African American cultural preservation in Flagstaff is a mural on the Murdoch Community mm. Center wall which was a, the original Dunbar school site, a formerly segregated elementary school named after African-American poet 
Lawrence Dunbar. The mural depicts Black community leaders and influencers from the segregation era. And if one did not drive or happen to walk down East Brannan Avenue, they may never know that people of African descent are somehow connected to Flagstaff. We are grateful to then community activist, now Mayor Coral Evans for organizing community members to save the Murdoch Center. And we are very grateful for our community chiefess, Ms. Deborah Harris, for being the preservationist of the Murdoch and the scattered history of Black Flagstaff. And last but not least, our community is incredibly grateful to Dr. Ricardo Guthrie, whose artistic vision brought together the combined talents of other local artists, students, and community members to complete that mural in 2011. It is not uncommon for communities to recognize and celebrate their artists with a gathering space to protect these sacred objects for many years to come. Today we ask if you know the following Black artists and have you seen their art somewhere here in Flagstaff? Deborah Edgerton, an NAU assistant professor in the School of Art, Dr. Ricardo Guthrie, Associate Professor, Department of Ethnic Studies, currently on sabbatical, and Professor Franklin Willis, who is also an NAU professor in the School of Art. I learned during uh, this research and, and creating this document that there is also a Black painter, his name is unknown right now, but he lives in Flagstaff's Plaza Vija. When we talk about the Murdoch Community Center, this is where we gather to celebrate King Day, Black History Month, Juneteenth, and Kwanzaa. We gather there to celebrate our achievements. We meet there to plan our strategies for obtaining equality and our plans to become visible in a city that does not have at least one street um, named after a well-known African-American. However, we must note that there is a downtown street and local beer brewery named after a celebrated scientist and public racist, Louis Agassiz, let alone uh, being a part of the peaks uh, given Agassiz's name. Meanwhile, the NAACP holds their monthly meetings at the Murdoch. Those walls contain class lectures, Southside Community Association discussions, and memories of birthdays, graduations, and wedding celebrations. It is a space that taught young leaders how to respond to, but all lives matter. The Murdoch has been a preschool from Monday to Friday, a blues hall featuring Winslow's Tommy Dukes on Saturday evening, and a church of holiness on Sunday. The Murdoch is whatever we need it to be at the time that we need it. Most communities have social clubs, bars, and restaurants representing the different ethnic cultures in that town. In conclusion, we leave you with the question of where's Flagstaff's Jazz and Rhythm and Blues Club? Where's Flagstaff's Soul Food Restaurant? Uh, where are the retailers that, that feature the fashion and products that Black culture has heavenly influenced in the media and on the fashion runways? Where is the Black the Flagstaff Black Cultural Center. And when will Ada, Porgy and Bess, The Wiz, Lady Smith Black Mamboza, and the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater, when will they perform here in Flagstaff? 
Can we plan to have Flagstaff's first annual African Arts and Food Festival in downtown Heritage Square next year? If Black lives truly matter here in Flagstaff, its leadership must establish tangible evidence of this in its schools, businesses, food and beverage establishments, social and recreational activities, and its tourist industry. There needs to be an ongoing project to record and preserve the city and all of Northern Arizona's Black history in one place. Most importantly, the city's economic development needs to encourage, support, and nurture Black businesses in prime areas that include downtown, historic Route 66, and 4th Street. Cult cultural and artistic activities should also be included in the city's uh, calendar. This discussion is meant to spark a commitment to support the representation, resilience, and historical preservation of the past, present, and future Black culture and lives. Again, through these town halls, the coalition wants to move the Flagstaff community from actively listening to supporting its Black and African American representation and preservation with moral conviction, personal involvement, and the investment of tangible and financial resources. How can we do this together? How can we create a visible Black presence here in Flagstaff? Come now, let us sit and reason together. And I'd like to end with a note that there are about 900 streets in America named for Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. King. They are in 40 states plus DC and, and Puerto Rico. And the Southern states have about 70% of the MLK streets overall. So I leave that uh, for thought. And at this time, I think Ms. Deb, you said that we will open the floor for questions. Uh, Bernadine, thank you so much. That was uh, such a thorough um, understanding of the um, issue uh, that we're here to talk about today. Uh, our facilitator for this evening or this uh, late afternoon is Warren Brown. Warren is the area director for the Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, also a member of the Alpha Epsilon Sigma chapter in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much, Ms. Deb. And again, uh, Bernadine, thank you. Uh, I, I, just so you guys know, I, after reading the policy brief, prior to this meeting, I called Bernadine and I just sang her praises. Uh, it's about time that uh, the context and the framework for the just the rich history of Blacks and Flagstaff was really put, pen to, pe to, put to paper via pen. And thank you, thank you so much for that. And I hope that you all were moved in the same route. So at this time, uh, how we're going to do it, uh, and you do have to raise your hand function. I'm going to ask a series of questions and we're going to get, get have discussions on them. So the first question that goes out to everyone is, what does change look like to you when it comes to representation and preservation for Flagstaff's Black community? Don't everybody answer ask at once. Please acknowledge that you would like to speak by clicking the raise hand button in your on your screen. And if some of you are having problems with that functionality, just wave in the camera 
so that I can, okay, there we go. Uh, I am going to start with uh, Miss Mary Grove. Mary, thank you very much. Please unmute yourself. And Mr. Uh, Guthrie, you will be next. Go ahead, Mary. Well, well listening to Miss Berta Dean, uh, she, she threw out a number of examples, like even just uh, like uh, a cultural festival in, in Heritage Square uh, to bring people's knowledge. Um, there could be more activities during uh, Black History Week. There could be, uh, you know, looking into having uh, some of the signs changed in, in Flagstaff. And, um, you know, I hadn't really thought of this topic so much and that, that this was going to be such a serious discussion, but I learned a lot from her speech. And those are just a few of the things that I thought of now. Thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mary, uh, for uh, you're, you're truly uh, evidentiary of that you were paying close attention. And I love the way that you um, brought your own take on it and your perspective and flavor. Thank you. We appreciate it. Dr. Ricardo Guthrie, your turn, sir. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Warren um, and uh, Ms. Bernadine. Um, I think it's right, as uh, Mary has said, we looked at foodways and folkways and all the things that we usually don't pay attention to in terms of representation. But um, Reverend Lewis was very clear that all those things that we do actually show our presence. And so even though we may not see it in the built environment, that's what we've always been talking about, where are the buildings, where are the houses, where are the people, um, our actions and our, um, and our influences all around. And so when Coral shows up, for instance, she says people start running and saying, oh, they're black people <laughs> in Flagstaff. She's just trying to shop, but people will stop, get out of their car and say, wait a minute, where are the black people? Um, and we've all encountered that. Um, so anyway, um, just that, that was just a side note. The foodways, folkways, and the things that we do to make our presence seem to elevate our very small numbers in um, uh, monumental ways. Um, and so uh, as we were trying to figure out then how to leverage that better, shouldn't we have built environments that reflect the black presence? Absolutely. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a city structure. Again, this is not a criticism of the current administration, but functions in the city of Flagstaff have not paid attention to the foodways, the folkways, and the other things that African American communities typically do that are not in the built environment. And that again relates to business enterprise. It, re it uh, reflects arts and culture and definitely reflects education. So we have that more than anything else. The only reason I'm here is because of the educational institution called Northern Arizona University. There's no other way that I would be here. I'm not in the sciences. I don't do medical work. Um, I guess I could be a laborer <laughs> and chop some wood, but um, that industry is not very strong right now. So I say all that to say, because the educational industry is one of the strongest industries right here, right now, that's where you see black folks coming in. Um, so if I could just tie up this um, small presentation, uh, Warren, is to say, one, the foodways, folkways, and the things that black people do are not sufficiently funded and supported so that they can be sustained. Two, the industries that we have used, such as education, it does work, but it becomes a revolving door because you cannot get promoted and sustain yourself here because it's very hard to live. So we put together a great resume and then we go elsewhere. So those are just two things I just want to say. If we think about this, um, speaking to um, uh, Councilor Shimoni and uh, Mayor Evans, to have city administration recognize those two things because they're not going to change. Um, if we get to 100,000 people, it's still going to be education in the top three and um, in terms of jobs, et cetera, it's going to be very hard to sustain without city support for that. So thank you, uh, Warren, for a uh, letting me uh, add those two things. Thank you so much, Dr. Guthrie. So since we're uh, in following in the same vein as the illustrious uh, Miss Lewis, I, I'd like to give you guys a term and something that we say in the black community. Uh, when someone says something that just resonates with all truth and conviction, we say church, not church, 
but church. church. Dr. Guthrie, church. church. So, <laughs> uh, do we have any others who would like to comment on that first question before I move on to the next one? Please don't be shy. Going once, going twice. Okay, and then in the event we have time, we can definitely come back to that question. Question number two. It's similar, but it's a different question. What do you feel, what do you all feel that needs to change in order to ensure, not to start, but to ensure that continued positive, positive development of the Flagstaff, of the Black Flagstaff community in this area. We can have things that will come, and as Dr. Guthrie talked about, come and go, but what are some other things that we can do to ensure the longitudinal preservation of this concept? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, Miss 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 Lewis, by all means, please. I, I I think it does have to go back to um, getting buy-in from the city's leadership, um, and you know we're we're doing this coalition and these town halls and the bi-weekly broadcasts uh, to raise awareness. Um, and so those um, community members that are attending um, can, can take, a, take a stance on helping to, to bring the message um, to leadership that this is what we need to do. Um, so it, 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 I think we're on the right footing, um, but I think, and I, if I could, I'd like to ask um, the participants here, um, particularly Mr. Bonnell and Ms. Grove, we need you to um, be our accomplices. Um, we need you to, to spread the word about this work that we're beginning to do um, because you all have the most influence and then that's what we're trying to shift. Um, so we need you to be our accomplices in getting this work done. And then we can shift our attention to together um, persuading city leadership to, to go in the direction uh, that we're trying to take this. Thank you so much, Bernadine. So now, Mr. Bonnell, um, I think that you have the floor. Whether Oh, I didn't even see your hand, but I just saw it. Whether you like it or not, you got the floor, sir. I figured out how to raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have answered the first thing, too, but I, I couldn't figure it out. Um, thank you all. This is wonderful. And, and uh, thank you so much, Bernadine, for that history. I live in the South Side and I've, I've been involved with the community association in the past and uh, I know a little bit about some of this stuff, but uh, one of the things I'm thinking is, you know, take advantage of the fact that at this time there are probably a lot of white folks that do want to help and don't know how. Um, and making uh, us white folks more aware of some of those invisible businesses um, might be a start. Um, and, and really, I'm kind of, um, yeah, looking for your leadership and direction to tell me how, how I can help. But if, if there's any things I can think of, um, I think it, there, I know there is a church, uh, what is it called, the Soul Friends or something like that, uh, it's like a coalition of church folks. I, I go to the Quaker meeting, um, and I know as, as a whole, we've, we've been really interested in getting more involved. Um, but that's one, you know, I know one of our folks from the Quaker meeting is on that Soul Friends group, 
and I think they meet monthly. So that's a way to get the word out to some of the other churches. I'm assuming you're already getting out the word to, you know, the black churches. Um, that's about all I can think of right at the moment. But um, yeah, I, and, and I think that's important to just be honest. It's, you know, yeah, I'm part of the majority at the moment. <laughs> and, and we do carry some influence and, and you need to make use of it. Um, when I was working in Philadelphia, I, I worked in um, black neighborhoods with, with neighborhood organizing kind of stuff. And, and the downside of that is there's a lot of times that folks said, look, you know, you're the white guy and they're going to listen to you. And I'm sorry, I have a bird that's talking in the background. Um, and, and part of my job was to, to help folks believe that they didn't have to just do it that way. That, that the point of what we were doing was about empowering them to, sorry, um, you know, to, to find their voice. Um, so I, you know, it's realistic to make use of the fact that that's the way it is right now, but it is, it isn't, uh, sorry, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> well, <laughs> so that's I want to be I, we are is absolutely, uh, we are absolutely cracking up because see, the even the bird the got inspired. <laughs> that's how powerful Miss Bernardine's words were the bird was like, "Oh my God, we're finally talking about this." So he, the he bird, is a white had bird to... though. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, he has a role too. Uh, definitely. Uh, the, the, thank you so much, David. And, I, and it should be noted that Mr. Barnell, he was one of the original outreach persons from the South Side. He did this stuff prior to Miss Deb. So when he says he's not new to this, he's true to this. Believe him. And his actions have backed up his words. So thank you so much. Next person, Ma, mi hermano de mi fraternidad, uh, Prince Ricky, as he's so eloquently called. Ricky, you have the floor, sir. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, um, it's like really short and sweet. Like I didn't have like something long to talk about, but one thing that came to my mind is um, I think the education that people that aren't a part of the African American culture, I guess I could say is very important because in order to first off try to um, understand or show empathy for a culture that you don't know about, I think it's very important to take the time um, away from being taught from someone who obviously knows the culture, um, but to take the time yourself and try to learn and understand the culture yourself before you try to make any strides forward because there was one incident um, when one of my white friends had asked me why, like, we have Black History Month, like, why we celebrate Black History Month, and she felt as though that America should celebrate, you know, have a White History Month. Now, when she had expressed that to me, I was at a loss of words, because one, like, Black History Month, to me, it expresses the pain that we went through, first and foremost, and also the essential Black history that has evolved for 400 plus years. So, I think it's important for people to educate themselves first before speaking, first of all, in that sense, and then um, to educate themselves before trying to move forward with anything. So that's all I had to say. But great points to everyone else before me. Amazing. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I'm going to pick somebody because I'm one of those abstract people that kind of pick up on these clues. And the fact that Adam Shimoni not only turned his video on, but he propped up and he was rubbing his hands and I know he's about to say something. And then Mel, I see you, you're next. You're gonna follow, follow uh, Mr. Shimoni. Mr. Shimoni, you have the floor. You know, thank you so much. I actually did, I, I have a lot of ideas I go into my head, but you know, I, I just wanted to turn my camera on and support the conversation and, and engage with my camera on because I do miss being face to face and this is a, is a, is a great way to you know meet that need but wow what a great conversation and, and and I'm just like just overwhelmed with excitement and ideas and and you know I really 
I really care about the things we're talking about. And I totally agree with you, David. You know, we have an opportunity right now to really do things in a way that are expedited and, and done in, in timelines that we, we wouldn't have been able to do before. You know, things that took five, 10 years can take half a year now, you know, and, and I just want to take advantage of that window as well, as best as we can. So, you know, I just want to hear the conversation continue. I'm really looking forward to hearing, you know, what comes out of these, these conversations and, and really working towards, you know, implementation and, and lasting change and, and, and just, you know, embracing this beautiful culture that we're talking about. And, 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 you know, we just live in a beautiful region with amazing cultures. And I just feel that we're doing a disservice to all of us by not better listening and collaborating and embracing. So, you know, I'm really curious to hear what Mary Evans has to say, actually, if I'm gonna put her on the spot, but chats to everybody. And uh, yeah, appreciate the dialogue. Okay, so Mel, hold on one second, because uh, Mr. Shimoni, uh, and when we say we straight oh, did something, <laughs> uh, when we say we straight did something, that means that there's emphasis. So what we say is he straight put the mayor on blast, which means that he threw down the gauntlet, which she, you see, she turned on her camera, she's got her paper set, she's cracking her knuckles, and she's about to come in. Because one of the things that I would really like the mayor to talk about and you alluded to it, Councilman, is where is this going to go? What is the end game? And as a result of this, what is going to happen? So, Mayor, there you go. And now, wait, wait a minute, uh, Mr. Guthrie went one of those signs. Uh, he said that you didn't give him one, so you guys got a meeting out back after this is over because he doesn't have his sign. So, Mayor, the floor is yours. Okay, so... Um... <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you all that are here um, today in part of this important conversation. Um, the way Ms. Bernadine um, uh, broke down the history of African American people here in the city um, was very complete and very um, heartfelt. And there's a lot of names that I haven't heard for many, many years. And that reminds me of that saying that you die three times um, and the last time you die is when people forget to say your name. And so the fact that you spoke many of those names means that we are keeping our history alive and well here in Flagstaff. Um, also, I was excited to see David uh, um, here on the screen. You know, David was um, um, organizing in this community before I was organizing in this community. He was the very first community outreach organizer for the Southside Community Association. I was actually in Sunnyside um, doing most of my organizing work and happened to have the opportunity to move into the house my grandfather built. Um, and then I was introduced to the Southside Community Association um, and, and started work for, with, with them. So I just appreciated seeing that David still here in the Southside doing what he does, making sure that he's in, involved and engaged. So I, I, what I think is really important for us to um, understand, and I think this is why the council um, said that we wanted to lead the community in a series of these conversations. Um, the African American um, population Flagstaff is now much smaller than it used to be. Um, not that it was ever the majority um, population, but it definitely was a lot more people here when I was growing up and there was a vibrant community and the economy and businesses and commerce going on. And, you know, over the, um, over the, the decades, over the generations, those changed, you know, as the majority of people work for uh, the timber industry, when the timber industry um, left and folded and and change into something else. Because the individuals that were here did not necessarily have the same opportunities as other people, they ended up leaving. And so there's, there's very few of us who are, are from here um, generational wise. We do see a surge of new people coming, just as Dr. Guffrey mentioned, that the university has attracted quite a few people um, who are um, of African descent um, and they're coming here to Flagstaff and it's a welcome to see those individuals who are coming not only to teach but to to be a part of the educational experience. Um, what I would like to see happen and I will not be on council, um, you know, I'm, this is my last term as mayor and so I'm moving on hopefully to a different position um, with the state 
But what I see, um, and I look at the vice mayor, I kind of throw it right back at him. You know, what I see is that we are working, um, I say we as a community, this is something that we've invested in, you knowing the members of council um, put on funding toward it, and we are spending time and effort. Um, and then there's a group of individuals in the community that are doing this, right? But it's we the community, everything happens as part of a community, part of a broader society, is that we will, um, we will adopt as a council a strategic plan. And the strategic plan will have the basic for our basic six elements that we as community members are talking about when it comes to the live black experience here in Flagstaff. And you know that strategic plan will be a framework, a guideline of how we move forward as a community, making sure that we honor all segments of our community, right? So um, as Ms. Deb opened up, she says, you know, there's a lot of different diversity in our city. And this conversation is just about one segment of that diversity. And even though it's a smaller segment, it is still valuable, right? And all, all aspects of our society are valued. And I know that, um, you know, Destiny came home from school. She's come home from school more than once over the course of her educational opportunity. Um, and she has um, been very clear. I went to school, I thought we were gonna talk about black history because it was Black History Month. And I was told that there's no black kids um, in the class, so we don't need to talk about that. Many of you guys know that my daughter's biracial and she tends to be a little bit lighter. And my whole thing is it doesn't matter if there's no black people in that class, we should still want to hear about the black lived experience and the richness um, that that population of people brought to our overall experience. We should want to hear about the history and, and about the lumberjacks and the railroads and the small businesses, um, because that's who we are, right? No matter, it doesn't matter what color you are in Flagstaff or what your ethnic um, background is. The fact of the matter is, is that everyone's differences together is what really creates this experience of creates the world creates the the fabric of this community that we love and cherish so that's what my my hope is um vice mayor um you know i will not be here um it's my hope that our council will approve a strategic plan that at least frames how we will interact and move forward i hope that plan includes um you know a lifting of the cultural events um that um, honor um, African Americans, you know, in other in other areas of the world, Juneteenth is one of the biggest holidays that's celebrated, and it's celebrated with fierce pride because Juneteenth is truly there's no more there's no holiday really more American than Juneteenth in my mind, right? Um, um, because of what it stands for, it means everybody is free, everybody um, has the opportunity to live, right? Um, we should we should totally showcase the music, the food. In, in my mind, there should be a lot more murals than the one on the side of the Murdoch Center. And there is a mural um, that is on the side of the lumber yard that has a black lumberjack in it that the mural mice did. But why is it there's only two and why are they both on the south side of the tracks really should be the question, right? Because again, that, that speaks to the segregation of our community where um, certain people were kept on one side of a railroad track and not allowed to go on the other. So those are just some of the thoughts that I've had uh, so far in uh, listening to the conversation. I will say that I have been busy making product while I've been talking to you guys. So that's what I've been doing behind the scenes. Um, so thank you for mentioning my business as well, Ms. Bernadine. So thank you. Carl, and that is... Oh, you're about to say, everyone look under your seat. There's one product for everybody. <laughs> you get a candle, you get a candle, <laughs> you get a candle. In my Oprah voice, um, Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, it's, it's just always just such a pleasure uh, to just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost speechless, but that's kind of hard for me to be Hermes Deb, Hermes Deb. But um, <laughs> I am turning this over to me, mi otro hermano, Senor Melvin Hall, president of Alpha Epsilon Sigma Chapter Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity in corporate, the most, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot, that's, that's, I'm having flashbacks. Mel, please. Thank you, uh, Brother Brown. You know, as we sit back and we listen to uh, the eloquent words of Sister Lewis and, and you hear uh, Mr. Barnell and uh, Mr. Shimoni and then you hear Ricky chime in, it really puts into frame not only the opportunity, 
but what the conversation is about because the lived black experience is really the experience that we want people to acknowledge. You know, people of color, we're here, been here, just like everyone else, some longer than others, you know, and to not be acknowledged as a part of that and to have people say we recognize your experience and your contribution is the opportunity we have. Because as, as Ricky said, you know, starting with our educational system, starting with our youth, starting with the people we have before us, we have the opportunity to go to our communities and say, hey, this is what we need to talk about because it's all about community and it's all about us collectively. And until we make the collective whole whole, we will continue to be torn and divided. And as we all know, it doesn't matter what DC does. It doesn't matter what Carolina does. We really don't care about them. We care about Flagstaff. We care about Phoenix. We care about Arizona. We care about our local communities because that's where change is going to be affected, effected, and impacted. So I just want to say we need to get this message out that the lived Black experience is really the lived experience. There's no shame in saying Black lives matter because if all lives matter, then Black lives must matter too. I'm off my pulpit. I, I enjoy these conversations. I really think though we need to, to expand them and get them to those that aren't here because there's a segment of our communities that don't want to have this conversation, that are scared to see what could happen from these conversations. So let's keep this work going. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. I, I really, really appreciate you. Um, the uh, there you go, Chris. There he is. Turn up. Uh, oh wait a minute. Oh, uh, there you go. You had to throw it. Okay, okay. So just so everybody else is aware, Chris, turn your camera back on again. Okay, watch this. Throw it up, Chris. Okay, so leave it up. So Chris did that. I'm doing this. So what what we did, in, and then Miss Deb and Miss Moore. These are all representations, our symbolic representations of our predominantly African-American fraternities and sororities. So that's how we joke with each other and we can communicate even without words. So when you see us or you see Chris barking, you know, he's not rabid. He doesn't, you know, he hasn't been bitten by like a mountain goat or something like that. He's just expressing his love for his organization. And you'll see us doing this and saying, go mob. and. That, that is what we do. And people ask the question, why do you have black fraternities and sororities? Because we had no choice. And if you understand the history, so we had to make it ourselves in our own way, that's what it is. Excuse me, Mr. Excellent. Brown. Hey, yes, ma'am. I need to clarify, I am Dr. Moore and that is Dr. Ricardo Guthrie. We work hard for our letters. Please give us our due respect. I am, I am so sorry, forgive Thank me. You. I appreciate uh, that, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry. Do well, your name didn't say doctor. So I'm, as I'm talking and I read it, so I just look at what I'm going. So forgive me for not remembering that. I, I guess I'm human. So I apologize. Dr. Guthrie, um, I apologize to you. And I didn't see a doctor. And anybody else I'm missing? Is there any, like, you know, name that I need to say or something like that? No? Okay, cool. Um, the, the next question that I have is in and based upon what we've been talking about there's some things i'm not going to comment but i would like for you guys to really think about this and provide something is what historical or artistic significant <clears throat> or other significant moments or representations that you are aware of that are lacking within the portrayal of recognition or recognition of the black community to Flagstaff. Um, Somebody? Warren, can you repeat that question again? What historical, artistic, or other significant moments or representations are you aware of that are lacking within the portrayal 
and or recognition of the black community of Flagstaff. So one, um, since I don't see any question, any hands, I, I came across something when I was originally getting engaged with Flagstaff that there was this movement about representing the black lumberjack as the mascot of NAU. I don't have, I just found out that a lot of, and, and if I'm misspeaking, please correct me, that the a lot of the original lumberjacks were indeed black, but that is not represented in the character. Can anybody comment on that or provide, shed some light on that? I'm, I'm just not familiar with it. I can talk. Oh. I can talk. Okay. Please. Because, um, black people from the South came here because they had been working in the lumber mills in Louisiana, Texas, um, Alabama, Mississippi. And uh, so they already knew how to do this and they were happy to come here and cut wood and get paid for it. And um, they found it easier to do that. Blacks and Mexicans, as a matter of fact, and Native Americans, they were just as plentiful as the white lumberjacks who become the icons for uh, NAU. And um, I don't know, I won't comment on Louis the lumberjack and how he has transformed over the, over the years. But um, we know the lumberjacks like John Williams and uh, James Williams and others who just live right around the corner. Um, but again, proximity doesn't always provide knowledge to those who are right next door to us. So it is a continual thing where we will have to elevate, I think, our own images and ideas of not Louis the Lumberjack, but John Williams the Lumberjack or James Williams the Lumberjack, because um, they were there and they do have a history that is enshrined in Klein Library Special Collections and in the Pioneer Museum. But we could do better at saying, saying what, what we're looking for, uh, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. And that's just, a, and uh, uh, Miss, Miss Deb, you have your lovely hand in the air, please enlighten us. Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, Ebony Magazine, um, I believe it was in 1953, sent a crew out to Flagstaff to do a story on the first lumber, black lumberjack. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know, Ebony Magazine is still around now, and I don't even know when it was uh, first started, but I know that the article is 1953, I believe. And so the picture that I saw was of a man that was, you know, older than, you know, that I, I guess he probably was, you know, in his, I don't know, whatever. But um, so he had been a lumberjack for a while. Um, and so I just think that those are the kinds of things that are missing um, that our kids should know about all of the students and all the young people should know about that because those people should not be forgotten. And when we don't have uh, pictures or information about them anywhere, um, then they're soon forgotten. Uh, so the Pioneer Museum has some information, but it's not enough. Um, and you have to really go looking for it. Um, so I think that that's another thing that could, um, you know, that we could do or that the city could do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Deb. And, and it's, uh, and, and I just want to make sure it's clear that I, I'm not advocating that we change the mascot. I think that some more inclusionary images and the least of discussion as far as, you know, the representation of that image and just the NAU educational system it brings so much to the Flagstaff community, I think that it would be a, a very fair question to ask. Can I, can I add something? I don't know why I cannot find my raise hand feature today. May uh, I say ab ab absolutely. And um, uh, Mr. Barnell, you're next after uh, Ms. Bernadine. So I wanted to, to Ms. Dab mentioned Ebony Magazine, which um, did its first publication in 1945. Um, so to come back in 53 with the story about the lumberjack, that's pretty awesome. I wanted to, coming from the South, give some context to names like Jack, Ben, and John, and Boy. Um, these are all uh, names that were um, the slave master 
found it easy to use just these common names um, for, for black male um, individuals. So Lumberjack, um, it was indeed uh, referring to, to men of African descent. Um, cowboys um, are uh, our original um, men who of, of African descent who, who were skilled um, with, with caring for livestock and breeding horses. Um, so historically, um, both the lumberjack and cowboys were and are still because um, they go back to the East Coast, Oklahoma and Texas still boasts a number of black cowboys um, in those states. So I just wanted to, to add that. Uh, and one last thing, um, just a few facts. Um, we, so we've talked about the lumberjack. But I wanted to, um, it's very important, as the mayor said earlier, that we call out and mention and remember our ancestors. So I wanted to mention Mr. Wilson Rouse, um, who was an NAU alum, and he was the first Black state official elected in California. He was the superintendent of public education. And so when we talk about Black representation being invisible um, here in Flagstaff. Not many people know about the Riles Building um, on NAU's campus, which uh, houses uh, the College of Arts and Letters. So I just wanted to pay homage to him and, um, and to Mr. Lynn Dorsey, who is Coral's grandfather, who was the man that built that house that she so often uh, tells us about and reminds us of. So Mr. Lynn Dorsey built that house over 70 years ago. And he moved here to Flagstaff to make just three cents more working at the Southwest Lumber Mill, which was then uh, located on the historic West Route 66. And then we have to mention Miss Joan Dorsey, who was born and raised right here in Flagstaff in the historic Southside neighborhood during the 40s. And she was the first black flight attendant for American Airlines. So, but she is living, she is an elder and still amongst us, um, but we still pay her honor and respect and we say thank you um, to, to the Dorseys and their contribution uh, to Flagstaff's history. Thank you so much, Ms. Bernadine, for uh, blessing us with that knowledge. And as we all here, especially those of us who are outside of the Flagstaff city proper, it's really, really uh, in, enjoying to, to hear that. Uh, Miss Deb, you, you had your hand up again or did you just leave it up from the last? Okay, you just left it up. Uh, Mr. Hall, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in, you know, learn, getting educated today on the history of the lumberjack and the role of people of color played in the early stages of the city of Flagstaff. I think that's an opportunity for both the city of Flagstaff in leadership and the Southside community and NAU to jointly put a message together that praises and, and speaks to the unity of, of the community and people of color, especially when you, you know, I just learned today, it's amazing to know that, that the original lumberjacks there were of color and they help lay the foundation for that beautiful city. So, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the opportunity in the messaging and using that as a tool to spur other conversations, as well as to break the ice and make people more proud and more accepting of people of color in the Flagstaff community. And I know I keep saying the Flagstaff community because this is about the lived Black experience in Flagstaff 
and how do we make Flagstaff more whole than what it already is? And again, I just encourage uh, Mr. Shimoni, um, as you, you know, progress in leadership, Mr. Bunnell and Miss Mary, you know, please reach out to, to the people that you know in, pe in places of power and encourage them, use that. You have the bonds of the history of the people of color and the richness of Flagstaff, why not marry that together? Such. Thank you so much, Mr. Hall. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm never, ever surprised, and I really do enjoy listening to you and just learning from you uh, every time we meet, because I'm always fascinated with your wealth of knowledge and experience that you bring to the table. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Um, David, uh, Mr. Bunnell, you had your hand up again? Okay, yes, sir, please, you have the floor. Hey, um, I had to put some distance between me and the bird. Um, I, I think the idea of, you know, putting murals up, um, for one thing, I participated in uh, doing a mural for, that faced the community garden that I was involved with, and it was such a community building experience just doing that. Um, we also had a, uh, across the street at the church, um, a like, graffiti mural painting contest that was part of a block party that we did for Southside. But I, I just think as a, as a tool for both building community, um, something that people are not likely to be as resistant to as they might be to other things. Um, you know, generally just beautifying an area, you know, if it's a blank wall somewhere, um, and a way to, um, to get some of that culture out there where people will see it. Um, I didn't know about a lot of these things because I didn't see something like that that would have shown it to me. You know, it, it's a great way to do it. You know, you don't have to go read a book or something and find that book to read it. You know, it's right there in front of you. So, um, yeah, I would, I would love to be involved with uh, anything that had something to do with that, but I think that would be a great way to, to start some of this. That's Thank it. you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Mary, you have the floor. Well, I, I had something else to say, but I just wanted to follow up on the comment that you just made, Mr. Bonnell, about murals. Well, if we had our Black artists in our community design a mural and then make it so that uh, we, you know, the rest of the community could participate in it so that they could learn two different things, some about Black history and some about uh, people that are live history <laughs> right now. Um, so that, I wanted to mention that. And you were talking about representation. Well, I was really thrilled. I think it was last summer when they had, um, you know, they had that big representation, Coral was on it, and also Shirley Sims. Um, I don't know whether it, was, it had started, well, uh, maybe um, Ms. Lewis could, <laughs> you know, I'm not getting the right words for it, but I, I saw it in the library and the li our library is a great place. And I even took pictures of it and uh, I found out that Mayor Carroll used to play ice hockey and that my nephew does that. So I took a picture of that, sent it to him, the text it to him. But um, those kinds of things, like I always, one thing I can do, I, I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm retired, I'm not involved. I'm involved more with the community now because I'm retired and I can do things like attend city hall or write letters or um, I can put messages on Facebook every time I was thrilled. I've been thrilled with the series of educational events that you've been having from the Murdoch Center and I posted them on my Facebook page and encouraged other people to attend. But, um, but the library is another central place and when you were talking about um, the history that uh, Ms. Harris has been putting together, is, is there a special spot in the library? I mean, do we have a, uh, a section of the library that is for Flagstaff history? And it, it seems like these articles and, and documents, uh, scrapbooks, whatever, I don't know how they're being, if, if it's all online, Ms. Harris, or, or not, but and that would be great to have. And I know the library, when they have their summer reading programs, that's another area just in the books and things that, that are chosen. 
uh, I know they were trying to do some things uh, this summer too. They had a lot of the reading was, you know, because that happened after the killing uh, of George Floyd. And there, well, I don't know if they prepared those things, but there was a there were a lot of books that were reading uh, by black authors and so you know that the library is one tie in too anyway thank you thank you you are absolutely correct uh, miss groba you you that that is a great idea miss deb you probably would ha have more information on that care to comment in terms of putting things in the library um you know, we have not explored the public library. I know there are some things in NAU's library, um, but uh, we have not explored the public library. And so that's definitely something that we uh, can look at um, in terms of some of the work that's already been done um, that might want to, that, that we may want to approach them about to see. Uh, and just so that you know, the, the event that, uh, Mary was talking about was the resiliency um, exhibit that the Pioneer Museum along with the Martin Springer Institute and the Southside Community Association partnered uh, to bring that um, exhibit to uh, Flagstaff and it went around the city here. So, yeah. Let's see. Thank you so much, Ms. Depp. Uh, Mary, you, you had your hand up again. Did I you just want wanted, to, another comment? Please. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that was the, I found out about that resiliency exhibit actually, because I attended the Juneteenth um, and there, there was somebody there at a table and they were talking about it and they asked us to, you know, kind of, it was a um, kind of a hands-on thing. So they wanted you to write down a person that you thought, you know, should be included. But um, that's where I found out about it, and then I looked forward for it. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're almost coming up to the top of the hour. We're really respectful of your time, and, and I cannot begin to express our appreciation for you all actively engaging and, and giving of yourself and your thoughts and ideas uh, for this most worthwhile topic. Is there anyone else that would like to say something? And Dr. Guthrie, you are there. All right, I um, um, just wanted to say, this is what we've been working on for the last, oh, I'll say uh, 10 years, where we had a Southside Community Association that was connected to two other neighborhood associations, a League of Neighbors, to talk about development plans. And it's been a continuing bone of contention uh, Deb and I carry the water as far as we can, but we talk about development as being how you develop the people, not just the buildings. And we do like the buildings that are there, but the reality is the people don't get as much uh, support in official development plans. So the Southside Development Plan that has just been approved does have a piece for the representation and preservation. However, you can preserve the sites and still lose the people. So as we go forward, let's think in a way that says all the development plans that come into the city, whether they're CDBG grants or whatever, include a portion, a pot, I don't know, 10%. <laughs> That's not just preservation, but actual expli ex explication of the people who are already here, the Reverend Sims, the, the Dorseys, et cetera, because it's such a hard concept that people don't see in the dollars and cents to recognize those things. So this Southside plan does have a piece about that, a narrative piece that can be enlivened through kiosks. So the kiosks are there permanently, and that's the living libraries that are there on the streets. But let's face it, unless we as a group continue to say, include that portion, 10%, or whatever it is that goes into um, historical preservation and, and kiosks that tell these stories. So it's permanently there because Pioneer Museum, Klein Library, and all the other special collections, they have a ton of stuff in their basements, but they can never roll that out. So it has to be embodied in the community by the people who are still here. Praise Lord, amen, we'll still be around. But, you know, I'm just saying, if, if that's a policy statement we can add 
then that's the, the hardest thing that we have to do. Because it isn't in the law right now. It isn't part of the books. But you understand that, Mr. Bonnell, and you understand that, Ms. Deb, and definitely Coral Evans understands it. But it's an uncommon knowledge, I think, um, that we haven't really um, found a way to um, in institutionalize. So that's, that's my final piece on that. Thank you very much. And uh, Mayor uh, Evans, please, uh, you, you will actually close us out with our last comment, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Deb to actually close our forum. Mayor Evans, you have well, the floor. So I just had two things um, that I, I think is important. One I think needs to go in this particular section because I think this is where this goes. So the city of Flagstaff used to have a Buffalo Soldiers Museum. Um, it was one of the most extensive Buffalo Soldiers Museum. This is my understanding, the way I was told, that it was on this side of the Mississippi. We actually had a Buffalo Soldiers encampment here in Flagstaff that was in the Sunnyside neighborhood area because the soldiers couldn't be together, right? And there's two houses that are still there that were the officers' quarters for the for the Buffalo Soldiers. So what happened was it was located in the Emerson in the Emerson Building which used to be where the new um, library is now. So they tore down an old school and they built the library. At the time that they tore down the school, they took the Buffalo Soldiers Museum exhibits, they, it was a museum, and they dispersed it throughout the country. And the idea was that they were, it was gonna be on loan. And what would happen is um, within three to four years, the city of um, Flagstaff would find a permanent home and the collection would be brought back and the museum would be reestablished. So the library, I think, was built in the 80s sometime. Um, and uh, people um, tend to forget this about this Buffalo Soldiers Museum and about the huge amount of Buffalo Soldiers that we had here in Flagstaff. And so the reason why I'm bringing it up now is because I think it's part of the Live Black experience and it's part of the history of Flagstaff and it needs to be memorialized somewhere. And if we are going to have a strategic plan, then I think it needs to be put in the plan. Now, since it's been decades, I don't know if it's a possibility to go get any of that stuff back, but I do want to say that we had one here that we had a huge encampment, that there are still houses here that they lived in, and we should be doing something to preserve the, the history of the Buffalo Soldiers and the story that they had. Um, and there's stuff in the city, the city archives about this. There are also people that at the, at the museum, the Pioneer Museum, that know about this. Um, they have history of that, the fact that this, that this museum was dispersed and we never got anything back. So I do think that there, um, that needs to be put in there because the city said they were gonna put it back together. They said it was only gonna be gone for three or four years. Um, and then the second thing has to do with what, Mr., uh, what, what Dr. Guthrie said, Dr. G said. I think it's important um, for us to also know that while we might want to have developers do certain things or provide certain funding, um, we are limited in what we can provide or what we can mandate them do per law because we live here in the state of Arizona. I do think the conversation um, in my mind needs to really be about the social infrastructure of a city, of a community and what that looks like. So we invest a lot in the transportation infrastructure, the water infrastructure, um, you know, building infrastructures. But something that, um, you know, our, our city, uh, I think the other people have heard me talk about, is the social infrastructure of a community. And so that means, you know, before school and after school programs for our kiddos, that means to make sure that we have a vibrant art, um, an art district, art community. Um, that means that we are going to have broadband internet, right? Um, and that also means that we are going to have um, a way that honors, promotes, and uplifts all the diversity that's within our, within our community. And I think that's where really the, the Live Black experience lives. And I think that without a doubt, um, Flagstaff is a beautiful place to live. But I think what makes us beautiful are the people that live here and the people that are here and the people that have built the, the community. And if we keep gentrifying our community in the way that it's being gentrified, then we're going to be um, a, a beautiful spot, but not so necessarily with a beautiful vibe. I've been to a lot of beautiful places in the world, pretty landscapes, some ugly people. Flagstaff, we have some beautiful people, I personally think. And that's what we're trying to, um, to um, maintain. And those are the people we want to survive. So thank you. 
Wow. Drop and with that she drops the mic. Um, thank you so much, Mayor. And Miss Deb, I will turn it over to you to close it out. Okay. Thank you all so very much for um, coming out this afternoon and spending an hour and a half with us to talk about this um, uh, topic that's uh, extremely important to not just uh, to the Black uh, people who live in Flagstaff, but I think it is important to all of our community. Um, with that, we have, this is, this is our second uh, Black lived experience uh, town hall. We have four more to go. I would appreciate it if you would pass the word on to your friends and colleagues. The next um, Black Lived Experience Town Hall is Thursday and it starts at 5.30. Um, people do have to register on um, Eventbrite and they can um, get the information. that When they register, their confirmation has the link for Eventbrite. So you need to remember that. So your confirmation will have the link and that's how you get in. Uh, we purposely did not just put it out there because uh, the platform that we have holds about 100 people. And we also wanted to keep track of who was coming into uh, the sessions. Uh, we did not, you know, living in the times that we live in, it's unfortunate that we have to, you know, be careful about or be protective about these types of events uh, because people will come in and try to disrupt them. And so we want to make sure that we have uh, people registered uh, for these events. Um, I, the next one is, oh, okay. Can somebody help me out? I just drew a blank. I can't. <laughs> what's, the, what's the third one that's coming up Thursday? Economic, oh, youth. I think it's youth issues and concerns. Um, you can look at you can look it up on our Facebook page and Southside Facebook page. Uh, I have is, a blank this afternoon because I've been is, in meetings all day. So it is um, on the twenty fourth. Um, youth issues and concerns at mm -hmm. five thirty. Okay. So uh, thank you all again for your time. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. <laughs>